Uh, welcome to another se uh, edition of an energy brief from ARPA E, where um, we're going to be talking to another seed performer. So my name is Emily. I am a fellow here at ARPA E. Um, I'm here today with uh, two folks from Frost Methane, Olya and Elizabeth. Um, for someone who might be tuning in to energy briefs, what is the seed program? Seed Start stands for Supporting Entrepreneurial and Energy Discoveries. It's ARPA-E's flagship program for small businesses who are developing transformational technologies in the energy space. Really excited to be here with Frost Methane. Uh, they won a grant in 2021. And so um, Olya and Elizabeth really wanted to kind of dive in here a little bit. What is your background that kind of inspired the project that you're, you're doing right now? And what are you doing right now? Both Elizabeth and I are technologists that have been working on environmental mitigation uh, in previous jobs. So uh, Elizabeth was working on a novel nuclear reactor and I was working on smart grid projects. Um, and I always thought that methane was a very un underexplored uh, opportunity. It seemed easy to mitigate, lots of concentrated sources could be used as a source of energy if the, if the stars aligned. Um, so it really looked like a good place to be. Um, and the real uh, eventual trigger was uh, in uh, an article in the Siberian Times that was pointing out these natural, new natural sources of methane that were very concentrated. And it seemed like there was um, a really mitigation technology that we could develop that could really help. Awesome. Um, and so kind of how, what, what is the technology that you propose with your seed grant and how does it work? Can you kind of delve a little bit into the technical details there? We plan to deploy this flare on sources of methane that are smaller than 200 tons per year of methane emissions. Um, and these sites occur uh, in distributed places in uh, both human generated and naturally occurring sources. Um, and the flare that we're developing is highly instrumented. Um, and that helps us be able to tune the performance to a wide range of site conditions. Um, and it also provides us documentation that we need for carbon market certification, um, which is how we plan to generate revenue from these sites. Um, and then finally, having that instrumentation built in gives us huge ability to uh, remotely manage these devices, which is really important for us when we're deploying them in all sorts of remote and distributed sites, um, because we're really trying to drive the cost of these deployments down so that we can install them in many places that aren't currently economically feasible to do a project. Um, and part of that means minimizing the amount of time that we have to have um, operators and technicians going out into the field to like recalibrate instruments or tune the performance of the flare. And so we have a goal to be able to do most of our routine operations um, remotely. Um, we have cell or satellite connection to the devices, depending on um, where they happen to be located um, and the ability to both downlink a bunch of data from them, but also potentially like control certain actions in the flare to help uh, tune in their performance. And, and I mentioned cost is is ultimately the driver of this. Um, we want to be able to open up the ability to operate on small to medium sized sites. And at the end of the day, the way to do that is to make a cheap modular easily mass producible flare um, that really serves a need that isn't isn't served by existing larger flare technology um, like you would see for oil and gas infrastructure or much larger sites. Excellent. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and maybe Olya, if you can answer this next question, kind of what is the potential impact of the flare technology that you're developing, particularly for these very small but steady methane leaks? So to figure this out, we looked at a variety of concentrated and continuous methane sources. So those are, you know, your landfills, your coal and trona mines, your abandoned mines, your abandoned landfills, um, even manure ponds uh, for some animals that produce continuous sources of methane. Um, now, what out of that is particularly well suited to these very, very small flares is, um, you know, is still something that we'll get measuring. But even in the large sites, like let's say a coal mine, the specific drainage points, um, there's lots of them and they're pretty small. So it really adds up. So if we just take that one, which is well, characterized as something between 1.1 and 2.5 uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. And so if we can, you know, take care of a fifth of that, that's like a really big win. And then there's all of these other sources. So depending a lot on the carbon offset market that we're playing in really depends on which one of these sources are economical. So manure ponds are economical in Australia in a way that they're not here. Um, but there's lots of large sources that are economical sort of worldwide. 
Um, so you say one and a half to two gigatons, if I remember correctly, can you kind of conceptualize or kind of put that into context? What is the equivalent emissions there? That's about all of international aviation worldwide is kind of equivalent to this methane sources. But if we stopped flying, of course, that would be a huge impact on our lives, while as this methane can really just be burnt and we could have the same, the same drop in emissions. So really much less impact on everybody if we just burn all that methane. Elizabeth or Olya, what was it like to work with RP as a small business? And what advice might you have for other small businesses who are looking to maximize an opportunity like a seed grant from RP? Um, I do think the application process was actually helpful to us um, in, in giving us a framework around which to focus. Um, you know, being in a startup or a small business, it can be a little chaotic. Um, and I guess I would advise um, people prospectively seeking these grants to use it as an opportunity to um, really specifically define the goals of a well-constrained project, um, both because that that makes for a compelling application, but also because it's it's useful within your own uh, project structure to know exactly what you're working on and why and how long you think it will take you to get there. What is something that people can do to really help out this effort that that frost methane is is working towards, right? Methane emissions are pervasive, problematic, and if we can address them today, it can have huge impacts on the short-term uh, emissions abatement efforts, all right? So what are some things that folks can do to help out your effort or similar efforts in this space? So the thing that anybody can do to help is to let us know if you or your cousin have a source of methane that they're associated with. So for example, they might be on top of an old landfill or an old mine um, that produces methane. There might be like methane in the water well. All of that stuff is really interesting to us because these are problems that we can mitigate. Um, also for anybody that is working in Colortrona, we'd love to talk to you because we think that there's lots of opportunities that are beneficial both from a safety perspective to you guys and from an environmental perspective to us. So um, any of those, um, anybody that's associated with a source or, or has some access to a source of methane, we'd love to talk to you. Thank you so much, Olya and Elizabeth, for joining us today. Really enjoyed working with you, um, your, you and Frost Methane, uh, especially in this area that is high impact, but a lot of risk as well. And if you out there who are watching this Energy Brief also have a small business in the energy technology space and are, you know, looking to find some funding to help support your efforts, we encourage you to check out our seed FOA on the ARPA-E website. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day.